Okay. So um, I, I had to include this picture on my beginning slide. So we're going to be talking about spiders today. And this is a, a deer spider that I used to have uh, years ago. She has since passed. But that is my Goliath bird-eating tarantula that I had. Her name was Debbie. And that is her eating a mouse. So I thought that that would be a nice, uh, creepy picture for the spooky season. So we're, let's get talking. So when we're talking about any type of organism, it's really important that we talk about classification. And so spiders are a type of animal. They are going to be in the kingdom Animalia, phylum Arthropoda, class Arachnida, and then the order spiders are in are Aranae. And that's really important because there are a lot of other arachnids that are in other groupings. And so that can be confusing for people because they think arachnid and they automatically think spider. And while that is accurate, arachnids also include things like scorpions or mites, ticks, uh, whip scorpions. There's a whole bunch of stuff. But then when we're getting into things today, we're going to be talking more on the family level. And in this case, I'm identifying the spider that's on the bottom right-hand corner. So that is in the family Thuriidae, and those include our widow spiders, but Thuriidae is overall the cobweb weavers. And so we're going to talk more about um, how you can tell that, because the widow spiders are a subset of the cobweb spiders. And so not all cobweb spiders are going to be venomous, so they're not going to be all problematic, but that can be something that you need to communicate with your clientele. So like I mentioned, these are going to be arthropods and characteristics. The main characteristic of an arthropod is that it has an exoskeleton. The bones are going to be on the outside of their body. And then for them to be able to move around, they need to have metamerism, which is essentially a fancy word for segmented bodies. They need jointed appendages. And then when you look at the picture on the right-hand side, that is showing you bilateral symmetry. So if you are to cut an arthropod in half lengthwise, the left and right-hand side of the body is going to be a mirror image of one another, not only on the external structures, but also on the internal structures, which is really cool if you think about it. So when we look at our common arthropod subphyla, we have crustacea, we have the myriapods, chelicerata is where we're going to be focusing today. That's where the arachnids are going to be. And then we have hexapoda and there, there's other ones too, but these are the common ones that I have to deal with as an entomologist. So when we're looking at the arthropods, like I mentioned, these are going to be in the subphylum Chelicerata, class Arachnida, and then the order is going to be Arani. And when we look on the right-hand side, these are all going to be arachnids. So that's why I was saying earlier, <laughs> it's, like it's very important to know we're just talking about one small group in here. So if you look at this, spiders are going to be right down here at the bottom. So they are going to be more closely related to things like the uh, tailless whip scorpions and the whip scorpions than they are to things like mites and ticks and scorpions, which are up here at the top. And I something I find interesting because people always ask me this question or they always make the assumption, Apeliones, which you see up here at the top, it's the fourth one down. Those are known as harvestmen or daddy long legs. A lot of people think that those are spiders. They are not. Uh, if you look at a harvestman compared to a spider, a harvestman has a broadly joined cephalothorax and abdomen. And so it looks like just one big giant oval shape for the body. When you look at a spider, they have more of a figure eight or snowman shaped body because they have that constriction between those two sections. And you can see that these are, I mean, they're closely related compared to other things. But when we're looking at the actual arachnids, the harvestmen and the spiders are further away than a lot of, of the other things that fall into that group. But most people assume, since they look somewhat similar, that they are 
either the same thing or very closely related. So in the subphylum Chelicerata, these are going to be animals that lack antennae. And that could be somewhat confusing for people sometimes because if you look at spiders closely, some of them will have very long mouth parts, which are called pedipalps. And lay people or what I call normal people, so people that don't deal with bugs and other things, they may mistake those for antennae or sometimes they'll even mistake them for an extra pair of legs. So the chelicerata are going to have six pairs of appendages. So four pair of those are going to be legs because they have eight legs. And then the other ones are going to be mouth parts. So those are the chelicerae. And they have those two distinct body regions. And like I mentioned before, sometimes there is a constriction. Sometimes those are broadly joined. But they do have a cephalothorax, which is the first section. And then they have the abdomen. And this, I put some of the weird ones on here because a lot of people don't think of these being similar, but they are all chelicerates. So we have our arachnids, which is where the spiders are, but we also have weird stuff like horseshoe crabs and sea spiders that are going to be in the subphylum chelicerata. When we look closely at the class arachnida, these are some of the common ones that we deal with. So here's our harvestman right here. That's usually what people mistake for spiders, but they are not. Um, but we also have whip scorpions, tailless whip scorpions, wind scorpions, and pseudoscorpions. I put some of the weird ones on here just because, you know, they're weird and I like them. So within the class Arachnida, we're looking at the order Aranae, and this is where our spiders are going to be. They have two body regions that are you can actually see they're separated. So you have your cephalothorax. Let's look at our tarantula over here. And this is probably my all time favorite tarantula species. This is a green bottled blue. And I have a, a baby one of these sitting in my dining room right now. Um, so you can see the front part of that, that is the cephalothorax. And then the brownish orange part of that is the abdomen. And then we can also see the four pair of legs there. And then we can also see the mouth parts there. Those are actually mouth parts, not antennae, not legs, but those are uh, pedipalps. So most spiders are going to have eight eyes. And that is what we use typically to distinguish the families of spiders. And so you're going to see me having pictures of that and talking about that as we go along today. The suborders of RNA are going to be divided depending upon how their mouth parts move. So we have the Labidonatha. So Natha essentially like mouth parts. Um, so labido is going to be lateral movement, and so it's essentially going to be kind of, uh, they almost masticate their food because the mouth parts kind of cross over one another, so when they're eating, it's kind of mushing it up. And then we have the orthognatha. Those ones, essentially, theirs goes up and down. And with the orthonatha, those ones a lot of times will inject venom that helps them with extra oral digestion. So they'll inject that venom into their prey, and then they are going to start that it starts dissolving the body tissues, and then they can then slurp up whatever starts breaking down. So here's just kind of the general breakdown of a spider. You can see the constrictions there the four legs, the palps, the chelicerae are going to actually be what have the fangs on them. And when you're looking at a spider, I often will equate the abdomen to kind of a giant water balloon. This is why I don't let random people handle my tarantulas because I have had people do that in the past and they get freaked out when the tarantula moves and then it ends up dropping to the floor. And that can actually cause its abdomen to break open depending on how high it is. And so I've had a tarantula die. And so I don't let people handle them unless I am also holding onto it or holding onto their arms. So I know that they're not going to flip it into the air. 
Internally, when we're looking at spiders, they have systems just like we do. Um, they don't really have a heart, even though that says that it's a heart. It's more of a dorsal aorta that runs along the top side of the spider. If you think about a shrimp, you have to devein the shrimp when you're cleaning them. That it's the same concept. So that is essentially, you know, arthropoda. And they have really cool lungs. They're called book lungs. And they're called book lungs because the little uh, structures look like little pages of a book. And they're kind of stacked. So again, different structures than us. Those are attached. The book lungs are attached to spiracles or openings on the outside of their body that will allow them to have air transfer, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide moving in and out of the body. And then, of course, you know, the digestive tract, reproductive structures, and you can see that the chelicerae or the fangs are going to be attacked to a venom gland. Again, wording is not good on this slide because that says poison. Um, spiders are not poisonous. Spiders are venomous. The difference between the poison and a venom. A venom has to be injected into you by a bite or a sting or something like that, whereas poisons have to be absorbed by your skin or you to consume something. So if you walk through poison ivy, the oils get on your skin, it's absorbed, and that is going to cause the reaction. But if you are stung by a fire ant, they're injecting venom into you. So those ones are venomous other stuff is poisonous. That's essentially the breakdown. So spiders are going to have silk. Not all of them will use that silk for um, creating webbing to capture food. I mean, usually when people think of spiders, uh, the most common spider that they tend to think about, especially at this time of year, are the orb weavers. And those are the ones that make the large kind of sheet-like web that will be kind of a grid-like, nice, organized pattern. And they actually use that to capture food. That's usually what people think of when they think of spiders. But not all spiders are going to use the silk for that. So they do have spinnerets and these are going to be glands that will secrete silk proteins. And they're actually seven different, I think seven, seven or eight, I'm pretty sure it's seven, uh, different kinds of silk. And depending on the spider, they can have different kinds depending on what they use it for. But essentially here, they are going to push a liquid solution through these, <coughs> excuse me, ducts or spigots on the spinnerets. And you can see that up close picture of it. And so it's essentially exuding that. And then the silk starts to spin up to make the strands. And the spiders can actually control the thickness of the strand that they're creating, as well as how quickly they're releasing it. And then the spinnerets can then also move to weave those strands together into a fiber. And depending on the spider and what they're using it for, they can, you know, use this for different things. So there are multiple types of silk glands that will produce different types of silk material that can be used for different purposes. All right, so we're going to start off with our largest spiders. And these are going to be in the family Theraphosidae. Um, these for, I'm going to say, our normal humans are extra large or supersized spiders. But these are our tarantulas. They do have their eyes in a cluster. So you can see the little cluster of eyes on top of their head. And these are going to use their silk to line a burrow, or at least the ones that we have in Texas. They will line the burrow entrance and kind of the tunnel with silk. So with our tarantulas, they do burrow into the ground and they are going to use that silk material to kind of shore up almost the burrows so they don't collapse. And our tarantulas, we do have 15 species of tarantulas in Texas, and they all pretty much look very similar to one another. <laughs> They are going to be usually anywhere from a light brown tan color to a more dark blackish brown color. And they are going to hide during the day. They are nocturnal. 
and they can either do that in crevices, cracks and crevices of rocks, uh, burrows, or other kind of sheltered habitats that they're in. And they are going to come out because they are active hunters, so they will come out at night. So here are some tarantulas. Not all of these are from Texas, obviously. Actually, all the cool ones aren't in Texas, in my opinion. Um, one of our Texas species is in the upper left-hand corner there. So that's essentially what they pretty much all look like. Uh, maybe a little bit lighter in color, maybe a little bit darker in color, but essentially very similar to that. But there are different tarantulas around the world that are way more colorful. And not all of the tarantulas around the world are going to be burrowing into the ground. There are some that are arbor arboreal species that live in trees. And in that case, they actually will use their silk or webbing to create little slings or hammocks that they will nest in. I have, um, I, well, I used to have the one up in the right-hand corner that used to be mine. That's a uh, orange Usambara baboon tarantula. And it created a little, it, it looks like a hammock at the top of the container and it would live in there. And that thing was so, so fast that feeding it and changing the water dish could be a challenge because it was almost like it would teleport as soon as I opened the container. It was like down in a corner and then all of a sudden it would be right there beside me and it would freak me out. So tarantulas that we have in what we call the New World, so in um, North and South America, those tarantulas will kick hairs off of their abdomen as a way to defend themselves. And that is essentially their first line of defense. So if you encounter a Texas tarantula, they're going to be kicking those hairs first off. And that hair was actually used as itching powder at one point in time. But the cool thing about these tarantulas is that the new world species will continue to molt after they reach adulthood. And essentially they will molt, usually I'm gonna say with, in my experience, once a year. And they do that to replenish the hairs that are on their abdomen. Old world species or tarantulas that are not from North and South America, they do not molt once they reach adulthood because they don't need to replenish the hairs on their body because they're not using them as a defense mechanism. The other thing that we have about Texas tarantulas is the quote unquote migration. It is not a true migration because they are not um, moving to a new location for living purposes. The large numbers of tarantulas that we typically see in the spring and in the fall are going to be populations of males that are emerging in mass to go find females for mating purposes. And so a lot of times if you hit it at the right time and the right spot, you will see hundreds of tarantulas kind of all moving in a same direction and that can really freak people out if they see it all right our next family is going to be anaphiidae these are our sack spiders and our ghost spiders these are small to medium-sized spiders they have eight eyes and you can see the eye pattern over here so when we get on this original you can see the general body shape and then the eye pattern there. So eight eyes, there's your pattern. They do have spines on their legs. These are gonna be anywhere from a whitish to a tannish yellow to a brown color. So they're not really colorful spiders in any way, shape or form. And they do use a sack web as a retreat. They are nocturnal for the most part and they are going to wander around and that's kind of how they hunt. So these are what our sack spiders and ghost spiders look like. Um, you can see that they all pretty much look the same. These often will be sent in to me as possible brown recluse spiders. But again, you would need to look at the eye pattern to determine if they are brown recluse. So again, sack spiders are going to have eight eyes. Recluse spiders are only going to have six.
So um, again, you know, just kind of general brownish spider. These are fairly common. Some people can react to the venom of sac spiders, but it tends not to be a problem for the most part on the majority of people. So here is our sac spider on our left. Here's our recluse spider on the right. And if you look at the bottom pictures, you can kind of see why people can be concerned about this, that they might confuse the two, especially if they're not familiar with spiders and their identification. And most, uh, again, most normal people, <laughs> they, they really, one, don't care what spiders look like. And two, they just want to know if it's going to cause a problem or not. And especially as somebody gets bitten by a sac spider and they have a localized reaction, they might be concerned if that is a recluse. So when you get samples submitted to you, you really need to look at them with a good hand lens or a microscope to look at that eye pattern to determine what you have. So our recluse spider on the right, you're gonna see that it has those six eyes on the front edge of the cephalothorax. And then you can see the sac spider eyes are quite different. They have a pair of eyes on each side and then they have that cluster of four at the center. Our next family is Araneidae. These are our orb weaver spiders. And these are a huge group, very diverse, very um, various colors, various shapes. But like I mentioned earlier, these are the ones, it's kind of the quintessential spider, that they have that very organized vertical web that is laid out in a very kind of precise grid-like pattern. And a lot of these spiders are going to take that web down every day and rebuild it. These spiders have very poor vision, so they rely on that web to capture their food. And so it's very important that that web is in good shape and good condition so they can catch that food. And, you know, I have been looking for this answer and I have yet to find it. So I need to I need to find a spider expert to ask. But some of these spiders, when they do take down that web, they will consume it so lose that material or that protein that they use to build that web. And, you know, I have some theories as to how they eat it, because if you think they have, you know, they have their little fangs, it's not like they can uh, chew it up or whatever, like we do with our. So my guess is that if they are going to uh, dissolve it possibly with their venom, and then they can reabsorb it somehow, or I don't know, but I have been looking for that answer and I can't yet find it someday. So here are some common orb weavers that you can find. Probably the most common and most asked about in my lifetime is going to be the one that you see in the upper left-hand corner. That is in the genus Argiope. And that is a, depending on who you talk to, uh, called a garden spider, a zipper spider, um, some people call them banana spiders, even though that's not really accurate because it's a completely different type of spider. And that actually shows you the female, which is larger. And then you see the male is going to be up in the upper right hand corner of that same picture. So here's your female and then here is your male. This one down on the bottom, it's called a kite spider. That is another type of an orb weaver. Some people will mistakenly call these crab spiders, but that is a completely different family. Uh, this one over here on the right-hand corner can really get confusing for people because they have a body shape that looks very similar to the thoread spiders or the uh, widow spiders because they have that great big bulbous abdomen. But again, we're going to look at the spider along with that web, and we're going to know that it is going to be an orb weaver there. Uh, family Philostatidae, these are the house spiders. And these are, again, going to have eight eyes and two clusters of four. They're usually a grayish to a brownish color. And these are going to have uh, almost a sheet web. It's kind of like a matted web that is going to line usually a little like cubby retreat area. And they will use silken strands 
that kind of come out of that little retreat area that are going to be essentially like almost like snares. So they're signal lines that will tell them, hey, there's something out here. But then there's also ones that are going to be sticky that can actually capture food for them and then they can go out and get it. So these are spiders that are going to be essentially ambushed. They kind of sit there and wait for something to come outside and kind of get captured on that. And then they'll come out and get it. So these are usually in hidden crevices and people might not uh, encounter these on a regular basis. So these are what our house spiders look like. This one in the upper left-hand corner is one of the larger ones. That one's a female. They are very, very beautiful. And a lot of people will mistake them either for wolf spiders. And then other people will think that they are baby tarantulas, but they are not. They are house spiders. The other one that is common is this one over on the right-hand side. That one has really, really long legs and you often will see it in uh, garages or uh, I know we have them in our storage room at our office and people always panic and think that they are brown recluse spiders. So I think people just see a brown spider and they're like, oh, it's a brown recluse. But again, it's not, this is a house spider. So if we look at the male house spider, again, comparing to our recluse spider, we need to look at our eyeballs. And you can also see on the bottom picture there, this doesn't have the uh, really kind of expanded out coloration of that fiddle shaped marking that the recluse spiders have. And the house spiders are going to be very much leggier than the recluse spiders. But again, we're looking at the eye pattern here. The male house spider is going to have those two clusters of four eyeballs whereas the recluse spider is going to have six. Family lycosidae are the wolf spiders. And these also are going to have eight eyes, but a lot of times the uh, people aren't going to see all of them. These two little eyeballs up here on kind of the back part of the cephalothorax, well, it's not on the back of the cephalothorax, but it's at the front part in the back of the eyeballs, um, they don't see those. And so they might only think that they have six eyes. But wolf spider is going to have four small eyes in a row. They have those two really great big eyeballs. And those will actually reflect light back at you. If you shine a flashlight kind of low over the ground at night, you'll see those eyeballs reflecting back at you. These are going to be camouflaged. These are going to be typically found on the ground. And so they're going to be camouflaged in uh, browns and grays and blacks to allow them to kind of hunt on the ground and blend in. These are one of our larger spiders, that, the, or at least the species that people see. Um, but they're anywhere from small to large in size, depending on species. And they are capable of biting. If they do bite people, it can cause a localized reaction, but their venom isn't going to re really react with our body chemistry that it's going to cause a problem. These are stalking spiders or some of them are ambushers. Uh, the ones that I like are going to be the ones that actually come out at night and they're active hunters and they literally run down their prey and get it. The female wolf spiders are very, very good mothers. They are going to not only carry around their egg sac on the underside or tip of their abdomen, they actually will um, attach the egg sac to the tip of their abdomen so it's carried around. So it does make it more cumbersome for her to move around, but then she is ensuring her offspring are going to survive until they hatch. Uh, once they do hatch, the spiderlings will climb onto their mother's abdomen where they hang out until I think they hit the third instar and then they will go off on their own to hunt. So these are our typical kind of wolf spider. You can see that they are very camouflaged and you can see on the bottom left hand two pictures, the mama taking care of those babies. And when you have the mom with the babies on her back, that's usually when people really kind of start to get freaked out if they see one of those and then they 
try to squish it or scoop it up with a broom or something. And then they have all the little babies running around and that really makes them panic. Um, the other thing is the spider eyeballs shining back at people at night that can really freak people out as well. So if I guess if you're afraid of spiders, you wouldn't be on this presentation. But if you have clientele that are afraid of spiders, that might be something that kind of scares them. But it's cool for kids. Uh, family oxyopity. These are the lynx spiders. These are, are another spider that has eight eyes. And you can see they have a pair of two small eyes at the bottom, then a row of four, and then two smaller eyes above that. These are going to have usually long legs with big spines on them that are very distinct to see. Their abdomens are going to be oval in shape, but they are elongated. It's almost like somebody's kind of pulling on the tip of the abdomen to pull it out further. And these are going to be hunters. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but these are found on low-lying vegetation, um, flowers, shrubs, things like that. And they will use their silk to trail a drag line when they are jumping to capture prey. And then they also will use that silk to um, create their egg sac, and then they will guard that egg sac until those babies hatch out. And that usually, that happens right now where they're creating the egg sac. So you may, if you go out into the garden, you might be able to find a lynx spider in an egg sac and her kind of hanging out right there by her. So you can see here on the pictures, the big old spines on the legs. And this is probably the most common lynx spider that you'll see. This is a green lynx spider. Go figure, real creative name. And then you can also see that elongated abdomen that is oval in shape. So there are different colors of lynx spiders, more interesting colors. And then you can see in the upper right-hand corner, this might be what you see this fall. There is the egg sac, and then that mom is going to guard that until those babies then will hatch out. Family falsity, these are the cellar spiders. These are another one that will get confused with recluse spiders. These are small to medium spiders. They have six to eight eyes, and they are usually kind of a yellowish tan color with almost to a brown, and they do have dark markings. Very, very, very long-legged spiders. These have a domed sheet web, and they use the threads in that web to tangle up prey. The females, again, they're good moms, and they're going to carry those egg sacs around to protect the egg sac until it hatches. So these are what our cellar spiders look like. You can see on the bottom left, that is the mom with some eggs there. And then you can see the kind of upper side of them and how they look a little bit different. I, you know, again, to people who regularly look at spiders or deal with spiders, these look nothing like a recluse spider. The legs are way, way, way too long. And the recluse spiders do not have those modeled bodies or legs. And so it makes it really easy to tell them, even if you can't see the eye pattern necessarily. So again, it does come down to eye pattern, typically when we're looking at them. So eye pattern of our cellar spider, we have those eight eyes. So we have two clusters of three within a cluster of two at the middle. And then for our recluse, of course, we have that um, row of uh, three, two pairs of eyes. Salticity, probably my favorite group of spiders. These are the jumping spiders. And these have become quite the rage in the past few years in the, uh, I guess, arthropod keeping community. So a lot of people are going to raise these and sell them for exorbitant amounts of money that I think is absolutely ridiculous. Um, I do have a jumping spider in my collection, a, a live one, and but I didn't pay ridiculous amounts of money. I actually just found mine. Um, but this is the largest family of spiders. They are anywhere from tiny to 
size. So various sizes, various colors. They do have eight eyes, but their eyes are going to be really tricky. So they have those really big kind of four eyes that come across front of the cephalothorax. And then the other two pair of eyes are going to be really kind of tiny and almost overlooked by most. They are going to be stocky bodied and they often will have very contrasting coloration on their body. These are active during the day. So they're diurnal. They are excellent hunters. They have excellent eyesight and they are going to use their silk to trail as a drag line when they are jumping. So it's almost kind of like a, a bungee cord where they would come back and that way they can climb up and then use that. The immatures are also spiderlings are going to use that silk for ballooning, which is going to allow them to disperse uh, away from the original area. So they're not kind of all clustered together because that could be hundreds of spiders which I actually, my jumping spider had babies and I didn't know that she had babies and they were crawling out the air holes. And so I had jumping spider babies all over my dining room for uh, many months this year. <laughs> and I would walk in and I would just have like spider silk, like I would walk into that web and it was like, oh, okay, I gotta go find the, the babies again. So I think that I have gotten them all out and released them into the wild at this point, but it's a possibility there's still some escapees somewhere. So here are the jumping spiders in the upper right-hand corner. You can see those really four big, large eyes that go across the front of the cephalothorax there. And these are just some really common ones. The other thing that I really love about jumping spiders, uh, when they're just, they're so adorable, but they're cute little chelicery. If you look at them up close, which I'm sure everybody does, if you don't, you should. Uh, their chelicery are often brightly colored and they're often metallic. So you can see these ones, this one's really up close and you can see that those ones are blue. This one down here has little green chelicery. This one with the little orange head here has little purple chelicery. I mean, they are just the cutest little spiders. And, you know, they, I don't know, it's almost like they're more human than other spiders are. And, you know, we shouldn't anthrop anthropomorphize things, but it's really easy to do with jumping spiders because they, can see you, they know what you're doing and they kind of can react to what you're doing. So they're just adorable. Okay, our next spiders are going, ah, kind of, whoa. This is gonna be our big group. So, or well, not a big group, um, an important group, let's put it that way. So these are gonna be where our recluse spiders are going to be. And these have six eyes. So the majority of the spiders that we've been talking about today have eight eyes. The one, what, two spiders ago, whatever that was that had six to eight. But these are our recluse spiders. They are going to be brownish in color. It could be anywhere from a light brown to a darker brown. They are reclusive. They don't like being out in the open. They are shy spiders. They are about the size of a quarter, including their legs. They do have that violin or fiddle-shaped marking on their cephalothorax. And these are going to be nocturnal hunters. So during the day, they're going to hide in that retreat that is lined with their silk. And then they will come out at night. And even when they're hidden, they like uh, dark kind of secluded areas where people aren't going to be really active. So when we look at them, like I've mentioned before, they're going to be a uniform brown color. They are going to not really have spines on their body. You can see that kind of violin or fiddle shaped marking on the cephalothorax there. And then the big, 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 big thing that you need to pay attention to is going to be that eye pattern that they have on the leading edge of their cephalothorax. They are gonna have three pair of eyes. That is the most important thing. And recluse spiders are going to have a 
uh, toxin that when they bite someone, it starts to break down the cellular tissue in the area that they're bitten. And that can lead to um, the skin cells dying, which will then have them sloth off and you can have an open wound. And most, most, not everyone, but most uh, healthy adults are going to be able to just deal with these just fine. Um, they might not even know that they were bitten by a recluse spider because it'll just be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm having a reaction and they take care of the problem with like antibiotic ointment or something and they move on down the road. But there are other people that are more sensitive to the venom and can have a more severe reaction where they would need to go to the doctor and get on antibiotics and that sort of thing. So when we look at our spitting spider versus our recluse spider, these are the ones that it can actually be problematic because they both have six eyes. So they have the pair of eyes on the leading edge of the cephalothorax. So you see that on our spitting spider and our recluse spider. But our spitting spiders, which are not venomous, are modeled in color. So that is our big key characteristic on those. So if you have a spider, it has six eyes. If it's modeled, it's going to most likely be a spitting spider. If it's more of a uniform brown color, it's going to be a recluse. All right, family three of these, these are our comb-footed or our cobweb spiders. These are going to have eight eyes in two rows of four. And these are going to be varied in color and shape, but a lot of them are going to have the body shape where they have a tiny cephalothorax and a very large abdomen, especially with the females. And these are also going to use their web to capture their prey or their food, but their web is going to be very disorganized and messy. And that's why it's called a cobweb. So when we look at these, probably the most famous of the thoreids are going to be our widow spiders. And these are going to be in the genus Lactrodectus. So all widow spiders are going to be in that genus, but that is only one small grouping within the larger group of cobweb spiders. So not all cobweb spiders are venomous, just the widow spiders that are in there. And we do have multiple species of widow spiders in Texas. A lot of them are going to be native, uh, but some of them, like the brown widow that you see there, is a non-native species. Probably the most commonly encountered native widow spider is the southern black widow. That is the one that you see in the upper left-hand corner. So widow spiders are going to have a red or sometimes a reddish-orange hourglass on the underside of the abdomen. Some of the species may not have a full hourglass. They may just have a like broken hourglass or two triangle shapes. You see the Northern Black Widow, you can get that one up towards Dallas. And you can see that one also has markings along the back part of the abdomen. The kind of newest one to hit Texas is the Brown Widow. This is a non-native species, and I read recently a paper that said that it is displacing the native southern black widow. So brown widow spiders also have an hourglass. Theirs tends to be more of a reddish-orange color, again, underside of the abdomen, but these are going to be a mottled brown color, and then they have that dark and light alternation between the colors on their legs. And these have a very distinct egg case. Most widow spiders, their egg cases, they have multiples, but they're just like little um, kind of white silk balls that you find in the cobweb. But with brown widows, they have their, their little round shapes, but they have little spiky things coming off of them. And if you see that, there is a brown widow spider somewhere nearby, or there was. Um, because that is going to be their egg sac. And it's the only spider that we have in Texas that has that type of egg sac. So here are uh, different spiders that you can find. Uh, these are widow spiders. So we have our Western widow, 
on the left hand side. You can find those in the El Paso area. The southern black widow you see in the middle, that one is, like I said, the most common there. And then there is the northern widow on the right hand side. This is just an example of cobweb spiders versus widow spiders. We have our widow spider left-hand side. Ignore the one that's at the top. We don't have that one in Texas. That's a Mediterranean black widow. But we do have the middle left one. That's our brown widow. And then we have the bottom left one, which is the southern black widow. The ones that are on the right-hand side are not widow spiders. They are not in that genus Lactrodectus. And some of these are really, really common in and around homes. So the top right one is a common house spider. I know I can go in my kitchen right now and find those uh, because, well, I leave the spiders that are in my kitchen and any other part of my house for that matter. Um, the middle one is a false black widow. I haven't really seen those too much, but I have seen the bottom one. I typically find that one. That is a triangulate cobweb spider. I often will find that one uh, in my garden. So if I go outside, that one's more common outdoors. But again, people see that body shape and they automatically think widow and it's not necessarily. So we have on the left-hand side, our triangulate household spider. Um, it's in the same family as the widows, but these are going to be not venomous, not a problem. You the underside of the body on the bottom here, and there is no hourglass or anything. So you don't have to really worry about them. They are not going to cause a problem. But I know that's probably not something that you can convince your clientele of. <laughs> this is another one that gets confused. And I mentioned this earlier. Uh, these are the Texas orb weavers. These are in a completely different family. This is in the orb weaver family, Araneidae. And you can tell while it has a similar body shape, to the widow spiders. Sorry, there's a squirrel in the backyard that my dogs are going crazy over. Um, you can tell that it's a different type of spider because it has that very organized, flat, grid-like web and not that messy cobweb shape. Family Thomasy, these are the crab spiders. Again, eight eyes, but a lot of people can't see them all. They're going to have large eyes on the bottom part of the cephalothorax, and then they have a row of very tiny eyes above that. Color can vary on these. It can be anywhere from drab to very bright. These are ambush spiders, and so a lot of times they're going to wait on flowers or plants for stuff to come in, and so they want to camouflage themselves so they blend in with that background. These are going to have very long legs on the front section of their body. The first two pair of legs are very long and they tend to hold them up and out from their body. These spiders are capable of working or walking forward, backward, and side to side. So very crab-like in their movement as well. A cool thing that I really like about crab spiders, there are species of these spiders that are capable of changing their body color. And I just think that that is completely fascinating. It takes them a couple of days to do it, but they can actually recognize color and what color they are on. And that way they can start sequestering those pigments in their body to change their body color to match the background of the plant that they're on. So they're camouflaged. So if you want more information about spiders, there are a bunch of different things that you can get. Probably what I would recommend is the one on the bottom right-hand side. That is Spiders of Texas. It's by Valerie Bu. Depending on your HEB and what they care to find this in the checkout line. If not, you can find it online at Amazon. And it is essentially a pamphlet that folds up, it is laminated, it has a bunch of different spiders for that has information and pictures. And it's a great thing that you can throw in a bag or you can put in the glove box or your truck or anything like that. If you want something that is more scientific or uh, more comprehensive, this Spiders of North America 
is huge. I mean, it's really, it's very large, <laughs> but it, it doesn't have color pictures. It's more of diagrams, like the eyeball drawings and whatnot that you've seen throughout the presentation are from that particular publication, but that is more of a sciency type thing. Helpful internet sites. If you want more information about spiders, there is Life Learn. There's also the arachnology sites that you can utilize. And I would recommend if you are wanting more information, whether that is on spiders or other types of insects or whatever, go to reputable resources, either university websites or extension websites, um, just because anybody can post whatever they want on the internet. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. So this is my contact information. If you want more information or you need things identified or you just, you know, want more information about bugs in general, you can follow me on social media. My Instagram is urban IPM. Um, we also do some podcasts if you stream podcasts. So that is how to contact me if you are interested. All right, I'm going to pull up chat. I confuse wolf with funnel. Can you discuss differences and is there a quick way to distinguish? Um, if you're just looking at them off the top of your, like if you're, if you're looking at the spider only, you're gonna need to look at the eye pattern. But if you are looking at them kind of out in nature, then the funnel web is going to have that sheet web that has the, essentially tornado funnel thing going down to where they hang out. Whereas wolf spiders, if they're not walking around, they are going to have, I'm so sorry about the dogs. They are going to have a burrow that they kind of go into, or they're going to go into a crack and crevice. So it's easier for those if you have more information from the environment to determine which one's which versus the actual just a spider brought to you. But if you are looking at the actual spiders, you would need to look at the eye pattern. 